So I would like to welcome the participants, the panelists, the researchers, the academics, the industry, government and society to this US, a conference in Sao Paulo. And first of all, I would like to thank the conference committee for opening the space in the conference for the discussion of the challenges of social perception and public engagement towards sustainability. My name is Karen Luis Mascarenhas. I'm the deputy coordinator of a project which is called Social Perception and Science Diplomacy on uh, Technology Transitions towards a low carbon society. This project, uh, we take it ahead in the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation in the University of Sao Paulo, where we are here. Um, um, uh, Professor Sigmar is the coordinator of the project here together with me, and also Suani Coelho, who also works at the Research Center. We are all together here. Unfortunately, unfortunately we can't have everybody over, but at least a small group of people are here. Okay, um, I'm also the, the Director for Human Resources uh, at the Center, um, and I welcome everybody. So, well, first of all, um, I would like to, um, yeah, it does not work. <laughs> oh, sorry, my presentation doesn't go ahead. Just, just a bit. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, um, so, um, as the, this uh, conference has been discussing, one of the main challenges of this century is to drastically reduce carbon emissions, limiting the global average temperature, increase to up to two degrees Celsius, uh, then reviewed to aim to uh, 1.5 at most above the pre-industrial area. So other challenges also include the access to clean and fresh water, as well as energy convention, enabling well-being, livelihoods, and at the same time, preserving the environment, the nature, and the ecosystems. Well, Latin America is one of the regions that has been the most affected by climate change, visible by droughts, forest fires, and floods in some areas, deepening problems such as poverty and hunger, uh, calling for climate change for all. So, well, uh, the Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Innovation, where we work, is, is focusing on developing solutions to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and supporting Brazil to achieve the nationally determined contributions through research and innovation. Uh, so, uh, the center is a result of a joint effort from the government, which is through uh, FAPES, which is the funding agency of the state of Sao Paulo, the industry through Shell and academia by the University of Sao Paulo in a triple helix uh, structure, which the three are working together in the effort to develop these solutions. Um, so the center is working on solutions to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So with technological, economic, They, they are expected. So how, to, how do we achieve uh, this development without harming the environment and the planet, you know? So that's exactly what we're working here. So focusing on solutions that are going to uh, developing the technologies, developing economics and developing environmental solutions, but also where uh, uh, development and preservation demands understanding people's values, behaviors, and in order to deal with their expectations, reactions through sounding communication. So here we have to include also society. So recently we started a year ago, a project focusing exactly on that. Uh, society has an important role to play, uh, changing habits, assuming conscious consumption, recycling residues, and <coughs> adopting clean energy and sustainable pro products. Uh, this will require the contribution from all. So recently, the research center has started a multidisciplinary project to integrate society in the research uh, to work together. One of the first efforts of the project in social perception uh, and science diplomacy on technology transitions towards a low carbon society 
was to search in the literature. Oh, sorry. Oh, here. I'm sorry, it's very sensible here. Okay, okay. so, uh, so we, we, we worked here with a multidisciplinary uh, group to understand uh, to understand the main factors that influence the social perception of different energy sources and technologies. So we identified 15 of these categories. The, uh, the, you can name them like the risk perception, the benefit perception, the psychological factors, um, depending on the technology also if the people accept or not, uh, the previous and the actual experience they have with the different technologies, uh, the knowledge they have about them, because these technologies are complex and lots of times not uh, very easy for the people to understand or even for them to have knowledge uh, awareness about them, for what they are doing, uh, what is their aim objectives. Communication, um, the relation they have with these stakeholders, the economic aspects, the policies that are in place or not, uh, the environmental aspects, the social demographics, that depends on, on the area these people live, depends on the, the kind of knowledge they have, depends uh, among the, the level of education. Also the cultural aspects, the decision-making process, and also ethics. So when we talk about the social perception here, we mean the society as a whole. So it includes government, industry, academia, um, the NGOs, the media, the investors, mainly all people. So when we talk about these perceptions and understanding how people uh, receive and perceive these different technologies and how they cope with uh, adapting to climate change are aiming uh, as what we aim to discuss. So the objective of this panel is to discuss the social challenges in the Latin America scenario, focusing on the latest research on social perception, engagement, technology acceptance, and sustainable behaviors, providing <coughs> new perspectives for all stakeholders. So here together, we have a multidisciplinary team of specialists from different backgrounds and expertise that will present their views on the major social challenges in climate mitigation and adaptation, clean energy availability, and their effects on employment and income opportunities. In addition, they will provide a reflection on people's behaviors and engagement towards different technologies and solutions in energy, water, and integrated systems. So to begin, I would like to introduce then our panel on the challenges of social perception and public engagement towards sustainability. And our first speaker, which is Dr. Rocio Diaz Alves. She's a senior researcher fellow at the Center of Environmental Policy of Imperial College London since 2004. She acted as a deputy director and energy and climate change program leader for the Stockholm Environmental Institution, its Institute, Africa Center in Kenya from October 2017 to March 2022. She has extensive work and academic experience in sustainable assessment and environmental management tools and methodologies. Her research area focuses on sustainability, assessment, and deployment of bioeconomy land use and natural resources, and the synergies with energy, sustainability, and other SDGs. Her research interests are in sustainability assessment, economic, environmental, social, and political institutional, with applications to renewable energy and climate change impacts. Let's welcome Dr. Rocio. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Karen, and for the invitation to this panel. And um, I think it is a, a very important topic. And let me just share my screen with you. And could you just please confirm you can actually see it? Um, yes, but you can put it, yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, I think uh, the, the, 
presentation is going to be on an overview of, of uh, these challenges and opportunities for inclusive sustainable pathways for bioenergy and bioeconomy in Latin America. But this is, these pathways are, also, are uh, related to social perception, social acceptance and public engagement. And um, I think what I'm going to do is just to give you a brief overview of this and some of the methods that I have been using for different projects. So um, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I mean, the, the, the main phase that we are, uh, the main impacts that we are facing related to climate change are, um, we can see them in these climate change hotspots and the impacts they have in Latin America. As you can see, um, uh, all the areas that are close to the, um, to the coastlines are, are severely impacted, of course, inland areas as well. And I think uh, uh, from this work that uh, is, is not mine, it's from Montenegro and I, but I'll, uh, you can see what they presented as the current observed impacts and what they are expected in 2100. And if you have been following the news in Europe, you have seen the problems we have now with these impacts on climate change. So they go from these increasing temperatures to higher frequency of extreme rainfalls to um, decreasing rainfalls and also the higher frequency of the storms and hurricanes. And you can see that literally all Latin America is going to be affected uh, or it's expected to be affected by that time. And if we see also the cumulative uh, uh, CO2 emissions uh, in, the, in the region, you can also see that uh, it's many of the countries in Latin America have at, at least had until 2020, the emissions similar to the uh, most industrialized countries also in Europe and certain other areas in, in um, Asia. And we cannot forget about the impacts that COVID-19 has had. So if you see here, uh, the difference between South America, North America, and Europe, it's, it's really significant in, the, in terms of the deaths per, per million. For the cases of Africa and Asia, it is it's still on doubt of the number of, of uh, the data, if it was collected in the same way as in other regions to really determine that. But what it is important here is to see what it has the impact in terms of the depth of recession. And you can see Latin America also, how badly was it affected between 2020 and 21. And although it is starting to go into uh, uh, some kind of recovery, we know that there are still many things that we have to do. So moving into the access to electricity, that is an area that Latin America in general has managed to um, uh, improve uh, consistently since the 1990s up until 2020s. But we still know that, uh, we know that there are still a number of people, uh, quite a large number in rural uh, areas that have not access to electricity. But so re within the renewables uh, energy, we have bioenergy and you can see here the domestic supply of biomass that was up until 2018 for the Americas. And you can see, that the liquid biofuels were significant. And this was mostly for uh, uh, certain countries in Latin America, but it's significant compared to the rest of the, of the other global areas. And liquid biofuels are the ones that uh, still have uh, uh, quite significant, um, but uh, solid biofuels are still used particularly in, in rural areas. And this is mostly for cooking. So here it's where we can discuss what is bioeconomy. And bioeconomy is really a move from this kind of uh, low productivity natural economies to these uh, high input fossil economies but with all the implications of, of them on climate change to this bioeconomy where we use these biological resources and to value added products such as food, feed and bio-based products, including bioenergy. And the relationship that bioeconomy has with the SDGs is really how we can create this value from the natural resources to have implications, uh, positive implications as we are trying to do for, with society and with e economy and uh, how we can link them also to circular economy. So these emerging opportunities look at food security, health and well-being, bio-based industrial development, and this aspect of sustainable energy, which includes also not just liquid biofuels, but solid biofuels, biogas, and of course, all of them can be related to other types of renewable energy. So most of the research that I have been doing has uh, focused on the methodologies to assess the sustainability assessment of these 
uh, different forms. And one of them is, of course, uh, through the use of, of indicators and uh, sustainability uh, assessment. So um, we have been using this uh, uh, framework for, for a number of years where we can uh, have uh, four pillars of sustainability rather than three. We can use social economic, but also policy and institutions. And, and this is also governance. So much of this social acceptance, perception, and engagement comes into, into this uh, governance system. But we still need data and indicators, and that is also why this is a novel area. So we can talk, for example, about uh, social actors and the acceptance and bioeconomy. So uh, how the wider society uh, knows or is uh, uh, still largely ignorant of what it is, what does it mean, and what it does and how these different social actors may be understanding this, but in different ways. So as uh, Beckner and Kelly indicated, uh, the best technology does not good unless people use it. But how different social groups understand, for example, bioeconomy or, or uh, energy or bioenergy, as we heard also with the uh, uh, presentation before. So social perception and acceptance uh, uh, are um, uh, considered as embedded in, 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 in society and how these are adopted technologies and, and, and applications, how uh, there is an increasingly acknowledge as, as essential for their uh, successful development and market diffusion, or the impacts on the development of bioeconomy projects, uh, all their infrastructure and, and chains. And the biofuels, which is a sector within the bioeconomy, and it is probably the one that has been more widely documented. So all of them take different forms and involve a different range of, of actors. This social acceptance, for example, can be influenced by several factors. They go from awareness, knowledge, opinions, attitudes, and behavior to the perceptions of risks and benefits, or the perceptions of the wider societal and uh, policy dimensions and other sustainability issues. So we have been applying several of these indicators through a range of different projects and, and worldwide, but you can see that in Latin America, we have applied several of them. And in the case of Latin America, we have gone even from the use of different type of biomass uh, that, that includes bamboo that has, is, also has global um, uh, distribution, same as, as sugar cane. But you can see that Latin America and in, uh, undoubtedly Brazil is one of the main users along with uh, uh, Colombia. But also other areas that have been emerging, for example, waste uses and the potential of waste for other aspects within bioeconomy. And this is the case of Mexico where it has been improving for, through the use of circular economy. Or uh, waste uh, use also for electrical power in Brazil for, uh, as a case of how much biogas has improved also in, in Brazil through these different um, uh, bioeconomy uses. In addition, pellets production or, or other uh, feedstocks such as the case of palm oil, both Brazil, Colombia, and even Mexico. So with all these uh, uh, resources and how they can be uh, um, utilized, we, can, we have considered also landscape governance. And why, why for bioeconomy and bioenergy? Because this is a way where you can not just engage, but co-develop with, with the uh, social actors. So it is a must from sustainability point of view and in landscape governance, the inclusion of all stakeholders. So that means that you can have a common resource where all the local uh, and national stakeholders are involved somehow with the value chain you know, through the use of the of the final products and how they can also be engaged. So th it is a better uh, a better way to really uh, bring together the resources with them. But you have still to consider the trade-offs and synergies of bioeconomy and bioenergy. So from, from the environmental aspects to the local community and all the socioeconomic issues. So these trade-offs and synergies are the most important. So what are these challenges for the bioeconomy and social acceptance? Well, we still need to consider context, regionalization, and localization. And there is still no warranty that these benefits, let's say, of bioeconomy will be equally beneficial to all groups in society. And it may, if in fact, it may reinforce or even deepen existing gender and social inequalities. So gender is also an, another important aspect of this social acceptance. Views of, uh, from women and men are different. And even if they are equally interested in this type of sustainable production, they may have different access to resources, knowledge, labor. 
So we have to see how we can really engage into this uh, type of uh, uh, technocratic approaches on to see how they may affect socioeconomic, cultural, and gender impacts. And all this is going to be done through these studies on social per perceptions. So we have to keep in mind these just transitions. So just to finalize, how we can bring together all these issues on, on social acceptance is really through an, a strategic view. We had to try to link all these different type of policy agendas and all the views of all the different uh, um, uh, stakeholders and all the implications and pos positive aspects from all these four pillars on sustainability. So I will leave it here because we have uh, the whole panel to discuss. Thank you very much. I think you are muted, Karen. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you. That's a very interesting presentation. That was wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, uh, we have five panelists, so I would like to move forward to the next panelist, which is Suwain Coelho. Uh, she has a master's degree and PhD in energy by the University of Sao Paulo. She is currently a lecturer and a te thesis advisor in the graduate program of energy at USP and the graduate program of bioenergy, USP Unicampionesco, as well as coordinator of the research group by bioenergy, the GBU, uh, at the Institute of Energy and Environmental at USP. She's the former deputy uh, state secretary of environment uh, of Sao Paulo State from 2002 to 2006 and member of the United Nations Secretary General Advisor Group on Energy and Climate Change. Well, she develops research on re renewable energy, mainly on bioenergy and environmental and social sustainability. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sweeney Coelho, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, in fact, uh, when Kari invited me to come for this round table, I was a little bit worried because I am just an engineer and I have not so much experience with uh, uh, public perception and so on. But uh, I think that I could share uh, with colleagues some experience <coughs> in the areas of energy, energy sector, energy transition, and uh, tell, tell a little bit about how is this behavior? So um, I would focus on two main um, issues, the alcohol program, and then uh, our uh, energy efficiency program that we have for household appliances. Well, uh, the, the alcohol program, as you know, started in the 70s. And uh, it started just blending ethanol to gasoline. And later on, at the end of the 70s, uh, the government introduced the, the alcohol cars. And there was a strong campaign uh, for society to go for alcohol car. I remember, I remember there were advertising say, alcohol car, you are going to have one. And in fact, uh, people went for it. And the most new cars were alcohol and there were the, the alcohol available in the pump station. There is a law saying that every pump station in the country must have an ethanol pump. And it ran <coughs> more or less smoothly until the 90s, uh, when we had a, a crisis and a shortage of ethanol supply. Uh, sugar prices in the international market they were better. Uh, producers decided to go for sugar instead of ethanol, uh, and there was a lack of supply of ethanol. L long lines in the pump stations waiting for ethanol because the cars could run only with ethanol. So that has a consequence, a strong lack of cons confidence of the society. And of course, people moved for, for gasoline and alcohol cars started uh, to decrease and the uh, alcohol car production stopped. And this more or less remained the same situation until 2003 when the flex cars were introduced. And uh, flex cars, as you know, are vehicles that 
could can run both with ethanol and gasoline with any blend since pure ethanol to gasoline. And uh, despite the previous negative experience with ethanol, uh, people went for the flex car. People understood the, how important it was. And uh, in fact, the, the, the choice, the decision was in the hands of the consumers. And then they understood that they went for it. So nowadays, more than 80, 90% of new cars are flex cars. And consumers know well how to make the uh, decision comparing top prices to gasoline prices. If it's up to 70%, um, they go to ethanol, otherwise they go for gasoline. Uh, so it works quite well. Uh, on the other hand, so uh, the, the conclusion that it can take in the area of fuels is that society understand well, and uh, the public perception is very based on economics. The, if you see, ask people if they go for biofuel because of uh, climate change and reducing carbon emissions, probably even if they, <laughs> if they go, probably they, it's most this inflated by economics and by price. Uh, on the other hand, it's still talking about uh, uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, we had a strong decrease on demand because people was, uh, could not go out to, start to, to stay at home. And so the demand for decreased. So the offer of ethanol also decreased because the ethanol suppliers could not have enough possibility to stock it. Uh, and then they reduced the, the, the ethanol production. It was an uh, important impact in the ethanol sector. Uh, but uh, what happened was that, uh, you know, we have the Renova buy, which is the market for carbon credits uh, sold by ethanol suppliers to gasoline distributors. And by that time, distributors pushed for a reduce, reduction on the carbon targets. And they were reduced for half. Uh, it, it was a dramatic reduction on carbon credit with a dramatic impact on the uh, ethanol sector. Uh, and even more recently, this, uh, this year, uh, based on the discussion of reducing fuel prices, uh, distributors again pushed for reduction. And uh, what happened this year, just <coughs> it was issued a decree about that, uh, there was a postponement of the targets of Renova buy of the carbon credits from this year to next year. Uh, so uh, what we, we can see is that uh, if it, it, from one hand, society understands the importance of ethanol and biofuels and go for it when it's available and when it is uh, competitive economically. Uh, other stakeholders in society have a different uh, perspective. Uh, and they uh, do not see uh, the importance of biofuels for climate change. So we have this kind of uh, duality in Brazilian society. Uh, the second case I'd like to share with you is regarding energy efficiency. Uh, a little bit differently, uh, from uh, ethanol, society has a different perception on uh, energy efficiency, mainly in house appliances. Uh, we have uh, strong policies in Brazil uh, obliging all uh, manufacturers of household appliances, like refrigerators and so on, woven and so on, uh, to have uh, standards and limits for energy consumption. Uh, and it, it's mandatory that any of the uh, show 
when you're going to buy a new one. Uh, however, uh, what we realize is that people do not care so much about it. People uh, go more for the uh, type of the refrigerator, the color of the refrigerators, and not the uh, energy consumption of the refrigerators. So uh, I think it, it depends on if you, society has adequate information. In the case of biofuels, there is always campaigns and public is very much informed about it. In this case of the energy efficiency pattern, uh, there was not enough information for the public. So public does not know about it. And this is uh, probably true because in the recent past, when we had to change it, uh, lamps from conventional lamps for more efficient lamps, and there was a national campaign for it. Uh, then people went for it. Uh, it's important to note the, the participation of women, because women uh, taking care of, of the households, and the women decided they wanted more efficient lamps, because then the electric bill uh, would be lower. So it was an important participation of, of women uh, in, this, uh, in this sector. Uh, well, considering these two study cases that I briefly discussed with you, uh, maybe it's for the psychologists to discuss uh, why different behaviors from society. <laughs> I just give the, the back to the psychologists in the round table. Uh, but I think that uh, when people have a good campaign and they receive the adequate information, uh, easy information, uh, didactic information, adequate for the public in general, they understand it and they go for it. But uh, it's necessary to uh, really to do some capacity building with the society so they can understand why it's important or not, and how to deal with it. But I think we can, I can stop here and you can discuss it later uh, with, with some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sony. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, very practical examples of things that we lived over here and that, that did happen all the, all the, where, all the places in, in, in the world, you know. So the simple examples of, of, of how these affect uh, how these kinds of things uh, affect people. Well, now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Kathleen Araujo uh, to, to, to talk. She is the director of the CAIS Energy Policy Institute um, and she's an associate uh, professor um, at the Sustainable Energy Systems Innovation and Policy at Boys uh, State University. She is a specialized in strategic decision making and planning associated with energy system change. Uh, this includes work related to targeted adaptations, such as decarbonization of regional industrial restructuring, as well as unplanned shifts, including uh, extreme weather and cyber disruption. She also is very, uh, she's very into the uh, writing books. She's got two wonderful books of energy transition. And I, I think that what she's going to share with us is very interesting. She's going to talk about the critical ideas and lessons learned for sustainability and energy transitions. Welcome, Dr. Beth. Thank you, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Great. OK, thank you. So I want to thank you, especially Karen, for your leadership in bringing uh, this really talented panel of experts together on such an important topic. I'm delighted to join everybody today, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation as we go forward. I'll be sharing the screen now. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. It's not in presentation mode yet, yes. but we can I'm see it. for it to jump there. Let's see. There we go. Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, so in line with the broader uh, conversation of this panel, I'll be talking through a number of concepts and lessons for sustainability. Uh, I'll be drawing upon um, broader theory and practice in science, technology, policy, and energy transitions, 
um, and look forward to how we can progress with this conversation. So I'm going to start with a, a very basic concept. I'm not sure if all of you've uh, heard of it before, but um, it really stood out in my mind as I was thinking about this conversation today. Uh, and it's called the streetlight effect. So there's this old story about uh, a man who lost his car keys uh, in at night and he went back and was looking around on the road to find those car keys. Uh, he was looking underneath the streetlight to find them and a police officer came by to help him. Uh, they looked up and down, they could not find the keys. And finally the police officer said to the man, uh, are you sure they're here? Why are we looking here? And the man said, well, well that's where the, the light is. Um, and in terms of the, the broader takeaway of this, it is to look beyond the obvious or the easy answers uh, to, and to keep in mind that we may need to innovate to, um, to advance with our uh, solutions to the current problems we're discussing. So that brings us to this idea of lock-in and path dependence. Uh, path dependence in particular was popularized uh, by Paul David's writing. And it's this idea that prior choices can limit later ones. Uh, essentially through a crowding out effect. So even if there are more superior options that appear later, uh, for instance, um, advanced renewables in terms of uh, decarbonization, lock-in can block adoption. And so what contributes to lock-in? It can be driven by sunk costs uh, or the need for new learning. It can be also um, inhibited by increased uh, returns. So meaning, the more you use those older, less efficient uh, or less um, effective uh, options, the more value you're getting from your original investment. Um, Lock-in can also occur because of vested interests. So we have a personal stake for whatever reason in a given um, pathway. Now I'll give you two quick, simple examples. One is the keyboard that we all use on our computer and another is suburban systems, which is a little more complex. Now with keyboards, um, many of you may know, and it, the keyboards vary a little bit um, across countries, but generally they're not set up to follow the letters of the alphabet. And you may ask yourself why. Um, that's originally driven by a choice made um, back in the 1800s and continued through to the, the current day. And that's because the old printing machines and typewriters um, would um, jam up when certain letters were used um, in sequence. So the letters were redistributed on the keyboard to avoid the jamming of the technology. And yet today, even we're, though we're no longer using those old typewriters, uh, we've continued forward with a keyboard. And so there are more perhaps superior options with keyboards today, but we're continuing with the, with the older version. Now to take that to the idea of suburban systems, um, roads, infrastructures, and communities could be built to favor vehicle ownership. Uh, so we're investing in how our infrastructure is laid out, how our cities are put together. Those are um, reflects prior decisions, yet they can create a car reliant system that we continue to perpetuate because of those earlier investments and choices. So that brings us to the idea of carbon lock-in, which takes this one step further. And you may know Greg Unruh has written a lot on this topic. Now it's a special case of path dependence. And from the picture, you see this gentleman uh, wrestling with um, quicksand. And so it's hard for him to move quickly because he's um, stuck because of his previous choices to enter into the quicksand. Uh, now specific to carbon lock-in, uh, the idea indicates that industrial economies have become locked into fossil fuel-based systems with related developments in technologies and institutions. So a vicious cycle is created where diffusion of more um, advanced technologies or pathways are, um, are excluded out of the discussion or the opportunities frontier uh, just simply because people are working off of what they've done so far. This creates this self-reinforcing reliance on incumbent options that are not necessarily permanent, but they do um, create this persistent market and policy failure or system barriers, which blocks out people thinking about other uh, pathways. But there is good news. Um, uh, Peter Carnot and Raghu Garud, um, who have written a lot about path creation, highlight for us that we, um, 
we are not um, without choice in a um, in an evolution, a historical evolution where whatever you choose for previous technologies um, predefines what you're going to have going forward. Um, there are alternatives um, and there are opportunities throughout our evolution that can alter the status quo with what they call mindful deviation. So this acknowledges that um, there are open windows of opportunity for choice and new forms of human agency every day in a countless number of choices that we each make. And we need to account for this um, in the terms of the broader theme of this panel, we need to account for path creation, not only in our framing and our thinking, but in our planning, our budgeting and our governance. So remember this idea of looking for new points of entry that brings us to another um, set of concepts, the early and the late adopters. So early adopters have an advantage where they have essentially the first choice uh, of a new path. Um, they may be able to set the standard and they have the potential to become an early leader. So these are all gains for those early adopters. Now late adopters also have advantages. They can sidestep issues associated with early use by advancing um, to an, the next uh, type of technology or practice. They're not um, encumbered by infrastructure and sunk investments that uh, usually follows the first movers. The late adopters can also benefit from the prior learning to move directly to the newer and more superior uh, technology. Now this uh, difference um, was written about by Jose Goldenberg, who um, many in this um, forum may know, um, not only for his work with USP, but for his um, pioneering work within uh, the field of sustainability. Uh, so he talked about the notion of leapfrogging, specifically technology leapfrogging for developing countries. And if we step back and we think about sustainability and um, superior moves towards um, decarbonization, he indicates that developing countries um, have their own set of advantages where they can avoid those um, lesser quality, inferior strategies that were adopted by developed countries, uh, particularly with fossil fuel based um, consumption. Uh, and these developing countries have this um, fantastic and valuable opportunity to innovate um, and share lessons more globally uh, going forward. So if you take that concept one step further, we can talk about the S curve. Now, you may know of this idea from Everett Rogers who wrote about the diffusion of innovation in 1962. And there have been five iterations of that book. Um, I recommend that for all graduate students who have any interest in sustainability or technology change. Now, the idea was essentially um, uh, that Rogers put forward was about adoption patterns with corn farmers. So you can imagine farmers um, living near each other and seeing um, different ch changes in their harvest from one year to the next. And if your neighboring farmer has a better harvest than you, um, it, it behooves you to ask why and what you could do differently. Uh, and so the farmers were adopting uh, changes in seed usage and other farming practices by learning from each other. Now, if you take this, this idea further with the S curve and you look at the right hand side here with the top picture, um, the first F here, S here is the slow adoption at the beginning as there's learning and people are watching each other to see what works and doesn't work. And there may be barriers from old options. And then as you progress up the S curve, there's rapid learning uh, as more and more people see the benefits and they wanna get involved. And then when you taper off at the top of the S, that's because the market is saturated, um, just about everybody has done it, uh, and there's less opportunity to continue um, growing within that specific S. So it describes how new technology or practices progress acro across or spread across um, a market. Now, I wanna draw your attention to these two graphs um, because you can see you could have one S flow then into another one that takes the overall group even higher to a more superior um, uh, uh, domain. Or you could think about it with the lower graph where you have S's side by side 
So you progress up, up through one and then you substitute and jump into an entirely different pathway. Both are options to consider in this conversation. So if we take that thought one step further, um, Everett Rogers looked at it and said, let's consider the S-curve with types of adopters. So you have the early adopters from innovation to early um, adopters and, major and the early majority all the way to the laggards. Um, and the key here is to understand the differences between these groups. And I think it speaks really importantly to the perception and the engagement themes of this panel. Uh, these different groups uh, have different uh, saturation for learning. Uh, there's the all important role of the communication channels and opinion leaders, but most importantly, the differences between these groups can um, tie to their comfort level with risk and what they look to. So we'll keep that in mind as we keep going with the ideas. The last um, key takeaway from Everett Rogers' work, and you can tell that I like him, <laughs> is factors that affect diffusion. So he spent some time and really unpacked um, what were some of the critical ways that enabled change um, that matter, I would argue, for perception and acceptance. So he indicated that there's um, uh, the audience or the the People in a specific population can see an advantage of the change by looking at what others are doing. There is the compatibility or coherence of the change with um, the, the community or population's needs and understanding. Um, the complexity of the change can certainly affect the diffusion rate, the opportunities for testing, the opportunity or the, uh, to observe or to understand clearly the positive results. And so all of these factors um, are good to remember, as well as how the adopters differ and how diffusion occurs as we continue this conversation around perception and uh, acceptance. So that leads us to what I believe is our last concept before we talk about some um, energy transition cases. And this is the concept of unarticulated identities. And it's put forward by um, Josh Brinkman and Richard Hirsch. Uh, and it's a very fascinating topic that intersects not only with today's topic, but other areas such as marketing uh, and politics, but we're going to speak specifically about sustainability. So this idea refers to an underlying logic that may um, drive or define an individual's actions in certain areas, but may not be apparent in broader group trends, for example, in voting patterns. And when Josh and Richard were looking at this, they were examining farmers in a conservative area of the United States where the voting patterns were strongly in favor of uh, the conservative president, but contrary to the president's very strong pro-fossil fuel position, the farmers were adopting considerable amounts of renewable energy. And how do you explain that disconnect? And that's this idea of unarticulated identities and specific to perception and acceptance. It highlights a key key area that we should consider as we talk about change and ways to um, levers to uh, advance that change. So I'm advancing my slide and it's stuck here. Let's see. Oh goodness. I may need to take it off. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and advance it. There we go. Sharing it again. Okay, back up. Goodness. So that brings us to uh, technology. Oh, technology is always uh, challenging us to. It is, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Even when we talk about technology change, thanks, Karen. Um, so then turning to some interesting lessons from energy transitions. Um, this highlights just uh, a number of cases that I've looked at um, from different parts of the world. And we're going to talk about two of them in particular. But I want you to understand how some of the commonality that affected them. Uh, and this chart is probably familiar to many of you. It highlights disruption in the context of historical oil prices. Uh, and so the area in particular that affected these cases was originally the OPEC oil embargo, followed by the Iranian revolution. Uh, later, we had the global recession around 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, more recently, we've had the pandemic with the global downturn. And this line chart hasn't uh, been updated yet, but the, clearly the Russian war on the Ukraine is impacting all of us in terms of oil prices and other areas. 
Now, taking us to the transitions, I want to just give you a quick sense of how the energy transitions uh, looked in sort of simple terms for how the uh, shifts occurred. And we're going to be talking about the bottom two. So the Brazilian case of biofuels, um, and it's a real pleasure to be on a panel with two others who have already talked about that, uh, Rocio, uh, Rocio and Suani, and I'll be taking it um, complementary in a different direction. I'll also draw some examples from Denmark with their wind adoption. So speaking to the Brazilian biofuels uh, transition, so as we've heard already, there was pretty substantial shift. And uh, Suani, you did a wonderful job of describing uh, not only in research, but in personal terms of how some elements of that occurred. So I'm going to just draw your attention to the, um, the graph on the right that with the, um, with the line chart showing the first transition was uh, biofuels adoption between roughly the mid 70s uh, and the late 1980s. And you can see a pretty substantial shift uh, it's followed by a later sh uh, transition, which uh, Suani also pointed out that had to do with change with flex fuel technology. So the shift, and I'm, we'll talk principally about the first one from 1976 to 1988, uh, the auto fuel mix shifted from 1% to 51% with ethanol and uh, biodiesel. Now in terms, how to explain that? So there was certainly repurposing happening across industry, infrastructure, and driver practices. Uh, in the agricultural sector, there were new uh, practices for how to farm uh, that increased yields. And you can see from the um, bottom center chart how the sugarcane yield uh, improved pretty dramatically. And this is only up to 2010 there. Uh, the numbers continue to uh, improve. There were also changes with sugar mills. In they identified three markets that they could be targeting. Uh, the traditional sugar uh, market, the um, uh, ethanol market, and um, eventually the electricity market. And they found very clever ways to adapt the output depending on uh, what was the optimal circumstance in a given time. Uh, Sue and he had also talked about the adaptations with automobiles. Uh, so the early ones were uh, retrofitted to run strictly on particularly ethanol. Uh, later ones were manufactured so that they could adapt um, with the flex fuel technology so that the driver didn't have to worry about the conversion and they could um, make their choice at the fuel station depending on prices. So that clearly translated then over to fueling practices. Now, some key um, takeaways from this case were historical familiarity, which is sometimes forgotten when we talk about perception and engagement. So Brazil had a, an early hub of science that had looked at biofuels and had been producing biofuels for automobiles as far back as the early 1900s. Brazil also had champions like Jose Goldenberg, who we talked about a few minutes ago in terms of leapfrogging. So as a scientist in the 1970s and continuing to the present, um, but particularly in the 1970s when the um, urgent need to diversify was taking place. He was publishing with colleagues like Jose uh, Roberto Moreira about um, the technical viability and the common sense of, piv of Brazilians pivoting to biofuels. You have other champions in the sugar industry and later automotive industry behind the scenes also actively mobilizing to um, enable the change. Um, and perhaps importantly, the government role. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, it was uh, the key player defining the strategy for the country, but industry was a critical leader in the later days, particularly with the flex fuel technology, when the government was focusing on other priorities. So that brings us to uh, Danish wind, which is another example of rapid and substantial uh, energy system change. So you can, if we start with the lower right corner, you look at the electricity uh, in the period from roughly 2009, to 2021, which is really this portion, uh, the mix shifted from 19% to 49, but you can see that the longer term slope uh, was even more dramatic. And in the top right, uh, you see two maps of Denmark. Uh, while they're small, um, hopefully you can see that on the left, which was around 1980, you, the little black dots represent centralized power plants. So there were very few, but they were prominent in, in providing electricity for Denmark. And on the right with the multitude of black dots distributed throughout the country, you can see how wind technology has been adopted 
uh, by many um, prosumers uh, who are uh, providing the energy supply and consuming it uh, in a manner that contributed to the country um, essentially now providing half of its electricity mix from wind. And how did that happen? Well, back to the idea of repurposing, um, people's skills were adapted and materials from shipbuilding, which was a very traditional uh, craft and um, trade within Denmark. Another important adaptation in practice was applying cooperative ownership to wind farms. So historically, uh, Danish farms uh, or farm communities had shared equipment uh, in order to um, simplify their investments. And they applied that idea going forward to wind farms so that when they looked out their windows, um, they could feel a sense of ownership and benefit from the wind turbines that were running nearby. Uh, they also adapted agricultural manufacturing equipment to produce the wind turbines. Now, like Brazil, there was historical familiarity, and I bring this point up again because I think it's an important one that's often missed in conversations about perception and engagement. Um, people could think back to stories that their grandparents had told them about and to pictures they had seen with older versions of wind mills being used to produce grain or to um, direct water flows. There had also been a, an early scientific hub in Denmark and uh, was very critical in producing wind powered electricity um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Like Brazil, there were champions in the form of trusted scientists. In Denmark, it was Niels Meyer. When the government came out with a plan to adapt to the shock of oil prices, the government was putting forward the idea of nuclear energy, but Niels Meyer as a scientist rallied and uh, produced an, a scientifically based alternative energy plan, which he published with other scientists continually to counter what the government was saying. And through his leadership, he showed the Danish communities how they could, uh, they would have alternate choices, which they ultimately adopted. So other champions in that time were the national labs, home inventors who were inspired by Niels and others, and as well as the wind users themselves and members of industry. Like Brazil, uh, there was a strong, the, the government was a strong supporter at different points in the history, but it wasn't always. We know that government administrations change with their priorities, but uh, like Brazil, the technology change continued um, and is enabling uh, Denmark to be a wind technology leader today. So to wind things down, how do we think about societal acceptance and perception? Some key takeaways would be unplanned disruption whether it was the oil shock of the 1970s or today with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, while there are certainly negative uh, aspects to the conditions, they also present opportunities for change and improvement. We should consider mindsets and when we think about the topic in terms of early versus late adopters and how they're sort of programmed or hardwired differently. We should think about uh, repurposing with natural strengths, recognize historical familiarity, and also consider local knowledge. And local knowledge, I'll call out in particular, is not only important for co-production and value-enriched information, but is a way and a process that engage, can engage broader groups in the process and ideally um, arrive at a better solution that's locally important. Government doesn't need to be the leader all the time. Champions are very critical and um, especially with scientists can be trusted advisors. And lastly, we should recognize incremental learning in, in our framing. I'll leave you with a thought. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Fantastic. Very, very good thoughts here for us to think about. Um, let's move on then, uh, because we still have two other speakers. I will invite Fatima Bernardo. She is the Assistant Professor of Social and Environmental Psychology at the Psychology Department of the University of Évora, Portugal. She is a researcher of the Center of Innovation in Territory, Urbanism and Architecture University of the, the, the University of Lisbon. And her main research focus on the, is grounded on research, risk perception and climate change, and place identity and intergroup relationship. So I invite her to uh, share her thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. I will 
try to share. I don't know what's happened. Sorry. I don't know what's happened now. Sorry for my. You see my. Yeah, now, now, now we can see it. It's just not in presentation mode. We can see okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, Today I would like to, to, to talk uh, about people and especially how people think and how people act. Uh, so, uh, as we know, it's very difficult to change behavior uh, because we uh, have a lot of habits, automatic behavior, and usually change is associated with some situations to uh, high cost and inconvenience. So it's, it's difficult. So today I would like to talk the, um, a little bit about the barriers to behavior change and also uh, how to drive people to change behavior um, or the strategies to promote a more sustainable uh, behavior. So we can identify a set of barriers to pro-environmental uh, pro behavior. Um, Usually, we talk a lot about uh, pro-environmental attitudes and how, uh, how it is important to change environmental attitudes. And, but what we know uh, in, um, in Europe and uh, a little bit around the, all the world, and now, uh, um, now the people have uh, pro-environmental attitudes, but they are not connected with real uh, pro-environmental behaviors and the question is the behavior, the question is not um, necessarily uh, only the attitudes. So, um, um, people think that it's important to protect the, the, the environment, but they, they don't do uh, usually nothing uh, to solve the problem. Another aspect is uh, psychological distance and perhaps, uh, so one thing is it's um, think about that. Another thing completely different is act uh, with the correct behaviors uh, to, uh, to environment. Another important aspect is the psychological distance. Uh, Karen already talked a little bit about that. Um, as we know, when we talk, for example, about climate change, uh, this is a, a very abstract uh, uh, concept. And, uh, and sometimes the people don't feel connected with this. Um, usually when we ask people about uh, climate change, uh, people uh, uh, gave us examples of very distant things uh, that don't uh, um, have impact in their, uh, their lives, or they, they, or they talk about other people, other groups, other countries, other uh, continents. So something that is uh, far from uh, their reality. Um, Jane Golden talk uh, about think globally and act locally, but it's very difficult. Uh, this connection for uh, the ordinary people is very difficult because uh, uh, sometimes the people don't understand very well the importance of their um, uh, behavior. Another aspect that is important is, is this the perception of reduced impact of individual behaviors. Sometimes the people uh, think that percept, they have a perception that their behavior uh, has low impact, is not uh, enough important, um, and uh, that others do not behave in a pro-environmental matter, and perception uh, uh, have a high personal cost and inconvenience. So, um, they don't uh, feel motivated to, um, to have this kind of behaviors that are difficult sometimes and uh, perhaps uh, don't have, they don't have the perception of the, the impact of the, the behavior. Another aspect is the technology as a solution. Of course, technology 
uh, it's very important. Uh, but sometimes people uh, feel that it's the, the technology the technology can solve all the problems. Um, uh, in the uh, or the people have some individual behaviors like electric cars, uh, but he, he, for him it's it's enough. So reduce the perception of individual responsibility. Or in some situations, they, they, situations they think that we don't need to change behavior because technology solves all the problems. And they are more focused in the positive or impact of the technology. No. Sorry? Yes, I don't hear you. Sorry? You may continue, please. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, and, uh, and sometimes they focus more uh, on only on the positive impacts of technology and not in the negative ones. So the question is how we define or identify strategies to promote sustainability behavior. Of course, there are lots of aspects, but Today I talk about these uh, two, these three aspects: change knowledge and more than knowledge, change motivations, uh, change context, and uh, um, provide tailored uh, um, approaches. So the more the most common is to try to change knowledge, but sometimes it's only. Um, gave the people information about the importance of their behavior or um, things like that. So they, they, they act only um, at, uh, at cognitive level. And we need to think in environmental literacy, not only in cognitive terms, but also include behavior and effective aspects. And in terms of behavior, sometimes it's necessary to uh, improve um, uh, the knowledge of people about how act uh, in an effective way uh, to solve some environmental problems. And another aspect that is very important is the effective one. In several studies identify that people change more the behavior for effective reasons, like environmental concern or risk perception or uh, an identity identity to the nature, identity to the environment, then uh, for the cognitive aspects. Or in some situations, these two aspects are important to um, uh, improve the, the, the change in the, in the behavior. But more than change knowledge, sometimes it's important to change motivations. And it is important to identify what drives people. Of course, personal values are important. But more than the uh, personal values, the importance of group and the perception about what groups think, uh, in, in this case, about environment or uh, this, this, this question. So we know uh, that individual environmental identity is important and is strongly associated with climate actions. But there are some aspects that inhibit uh, the, 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 the pro-environmental behaviors. For example, many climate actions are associated with high personal consuming provenance. People sometimes may not consistently, consistently act on their values, and sometimes because do not uh, always consider the positive impacts of their actions. And they often uh, uh, underestimate how much others care about altruistics and biospheric values and climate change. So it's not enough uh, to have individual environmental identity to um, have the correct or the more pro environmental behaviors. We need to uh, add more things. And another, uh, and one aspect that is very important is group influence. Um, the group and the group influence it proves to be a par powerful motivator to change behavior because being part of the group, being engaged is an important aspect. 
uh, and in some situations, group bonds become individual bonds. What we see in this um, graphic is there are a strong relationship between, between group biospheric values and pro-environmental behavior. And this, this, this relationship can also be mediated by the environmental group identity. So the, the, the group are important elements that influence the, 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 the behavior of the people. Another aspect is the social identity. Um, people strongly uh, identified with the group and when they do not endorse uh, biospheric values themselves, emphasize the group values motivate pro-environmental behaviors. So it matters what others do or we think others do. And in some situations, this is important for to change the behavior. In this um, graphic, we have red lines and blue lines, and the blue lines is high values, uh, high values of identification. And the, the people uh, that have high values of identification have a, a, a relationship between uh, perceived biospheric group values and energy saving behaviors, uh, willingness to save energy for environment and other, uh, other aspects. So, uh, and this is very uh, interesting because it's the, the impact of group is um, stronger uh, in the individuals that don't have biospheric values. So it's more important in people that are, are not uh, biospheric values than uh, in the other people that have. Another aspect that is important, it, in the, all, all we know that, is the context. Um, context factors include special and structural, uh, economic and cultural factors, institution, inst institutional arrangement, and access to technology, products, service, and information. Uh, on the one hand, such context factors may affect behavior directly by influencing the opportunities and constraints people face in defining the costs and benefits of different actions. Um, and on, uh, on the other end, making behavior harder or easy uh, to carry out. So uh, context encourage, encourage um, to change the behavior. So context can be uh, an important factor also. And another aspect is community matters. I think it's my last topic. And the, um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the importance of community initiatives, bottom-up initiatives and tailored uh, approaches. So um, bottom-up initiatives or community initiatives uh, show in different case studies around the world uh, the importance of the community involvement in the um, change behavior. So when we ask, for example, in this, in this study, when we ask the motives to be involved, <coughs> Rated financial, financial and environmental motives uh, as more important than uh, communal uh, motives. But um, initiative involvements are related, are strongly related to environment and communal, communal motives, while financial motives are, are not. So community involvement are an important factor, but people is not aware of it uh, and uh, have an uh, impact in behavior. Another aspect, um, another study, individual, individual pro-environment motivations were um, only uh, related with the intention, uh, pro-environment intention, but the initiative involvement, the membership and identification was generally um, related with intention, but also with the behavior. So, um, the pro-environmental, uh, the individual, individual pro-environmental um, motivation have, uh, are only uh, related with intention, but the, the, the community involvement are related with intention and with the behavior. So with the, 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 the correct behavior uh, to a pro-environmental behavior, of course. So the same in, the, in some organizations. 
uh, this is uh, my company is green, so I am. Um, the, the idea is the relationship between corporate environmental responsibility um, and brown environmental uh, behavior are um, mediated by this self uh, identity environment. So um, uh, the relation between between uh, corporate environmental responsibility responsibility and self-report from environmental behavior was stronger among those with moderated to weak biosphere uh, values. So again, uh, the, the community initiatives, the community, the group influence are more important in the people that don't have biospheric values than uh, in, the, in, the, in the people that have it. And finally, the importance of um, uh, developed uh, approach that are related with the, uh, the, the community uh, uh, that are involved. Of involved. So tailored approach are called for taking into account individual and social cultural difference uh, and targeting uh, key factors motivating or in in, in, in inviting the behavior of the relevant people, and especially uh, to take in, into account social values and uh, uh, identities. I remember um, the, the, the Danish wind uh, example that Kate, uh, Katie showed um, before, and the importance of the historical familiarity, the relation between the the, the, the wind and the, the old mills as an important aspect is continuity in the identity in, in practice for uh, um, to change to change uh, behaviors. I have another example uh, in Evra, um, where is my university? Uh, one of the important aspect of the identity of the city of the residents of the city is the clinic, clean cleanliness of the city. Uh, it is a white city and the, the cleanliness is a very important aspect, dimension of identity. And in a recycling campaign, this characteristic war was used to increase the involvement of the people and increase the motivation to, um, to participate in this recycling uh, campaign. So, Individual uh, environmental values are important predictors of environmental behavior and beliefs, but it's important to include also group values, group influence. Um, group values can be used to promote pro environmental action, especially in people with low um, pro environmental uh, attitudes. Um, and uh, participation in community environment initiatives ever more impact. Uh, in the behavior. Um, finally, a participation in community environmental, um, yeah, I already said that. So to design tailored initiatives based on individual and group uh, difference and values are very important. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Fatima, for a very interesting presentation. Now we got into uh, a bit of the psychology, which Swani asked us to go through. So, yeah, and then let's go for our, for our last panelist, which also is a psychologist, uh, Professor Sigmar Malvesi, which is from the Institute of Psychology of the University of Sao Paulo and is the coordinator of the project, which I mentioned here at the RCGI. Okay, very welcome, Professor Sigmar. Uh, we are having a little issue here with the camera, so uh, we are going to adapt here, which I'm going to put this computer uh, just in front of Professor Sigmar so that he can give his words, please. There you are. Thank you very much, Kari for the introduction you gave and for the organization of this very interesting panel, very interesting discussion in which we have <clears throat> analyzed 
several distinct features of our big issue. And now I probably will finish this presentation with another issue uh, implied in our uh, uh, engagement towards sustainability, which is leadership. Okay, <clears throat> uh, climate change and the risks they expose are fast rolling down snowballs, dragging most knowledge fields and institutions into their path. The prevention and mitigation of those risks rely on changes deeply intertwined uh, in society's structures, such as lifestyles, uh, economic, cultural, and technological equations. That the complex interdependence between societies mature the structures and necessary interventions in energy equations forecast the prevention and mitigation of those risks as a long-term revolution-like movement. The crucial target of that movement is the replacement of fossil by clean and sustainable energy. Uh, being apparently an enterprise bounded to technical changes, that replacement encompasses coordinated activities through shared economical, uh, technical, and political and cultural projects, multidisciplinary and ideological interlocution, individual habits, and institutional strength to meet the strong and disguised resistance to the redesign of both routines and matured uh, structures and equations. The replacement of fossil energy demands interventions ranging from individuals to institutions and public policies. Its accomplishment is feasible and carried out through technical changes, but the acceptance of these changes and their effects are mediated by the public acceptance or resistance to the replacement of fossil energy. <clears throat> Although the axis of that replacement is grounded in technical solutions, their implementation requires acceptance and legitimacy of the short and long-term changes on the part of individuals, communities, institutions, and chiefly governments. All individuals, groups, and institutions are co-protagonists co of these changes, a condition which requires their acceptance of the change itself and the enactment of their adaptation to new existence conditions. That acceptance and enactment rely on individuals and collective creativity, behavioral commitment, and steady cooperation with the planet's sustainability. Being a sort of social technical enterprise, the prevention and mitigation of the environmental deterioration are matters of cultural movements, of re-education of society, of multidisciplinary knowledge, 
multitask performances and long-term endeavor, the achievement of which rely on a steady coordination of intertwined technical actions and continuous care of their acceptance and legitimacy. Coordination and legitimacy are outcomes mediated by the public perception of those changes, of the actions required and of their effects where they are demanded. That mediation does not spring up spontaneously, even when strongly supported by consistent scientific research and institutional demands as recently seen in our experience in the COVID plague. Affective and cognitive insecurity Pragmatism, individualism, consumerism, and denialism are relevant obstacles to people's acceptance of the role of environmental sustainability protagonists. These hurdles are rooted in the intersubjective context where public resistance finds its nest and is manifested through all kinds of rationalization and opposition to one's commitment to the replacement of fossil energy. Requiring coordination of sociotechnical interventions, prevention and mitigation of climate hazards, pose leadership as a crucial instrument for their feasibility. Leadership is probably the oldest human instrument. It is hardly a ser serialized tool and is far from easy replication as some technologies are in distinct places. Leadership is a handmade power, a kind of artisanship, a contextualized intervention. The power of leadership is built in the social interaction and therefore is not a permanent trait of individuals which they may take with them wherever they go. Uh, the influence of leadership is a property of the relationships between individuals built interacting with each other. The grammar within which leadership is constructed has not the same rules and norms in distinct groups. Latin Americans and Asians being built that power <clears throat> grounded in their respective context with distinct resources. As such, leadership is a power over others which requires sustainability in every new demand. It is rebuilt and sustained in social interaction where cooperation is required. The mechanism of that power has been assumed in psychology as the management of intersubjectivity through the social interaction. Its components such as meanings, values, and beliefs are sensitive to individual and social perceptions. The environmental leadership as required by the coordination of the replacement of fossil energy is the creation of competences for cooperation on that enterprise. 
the replacement of fossil by clean and sustainable energy requires the construction of these competencies, which is the construction of environmental leadership. The forcing interventions in greenhouse gases depend on integrated environmental leadership aimed at people's capacitation for being climate change protagonists. That is uh, the identity expected uh, from now on, uh, from on the part of everybody. There has been here in Brazil some interesting investigation about that uh, here called green identity. That capacitation is a long-term enterprise and sensitive to the oscillation of the public perception. Being this planet, our common home place, those oscillations require consistent and continuous investigation because today social interaction and the construction of the leadership power are heavily impacted by the social networks which the economy of influence is enacting through interventions in the intersubjectivity and in the subjectivation processes. <clears throat> the recognition of climate changes, the legitimacy of technical solutions, the quest for cooperation uh, uh, towards towards environmental sustainability and solid commitment of all protagonists, the green protagonists, as we have called here, are targets which mediate the successful achievement of the replacement we are looking for. The subjective changes comprised in these targets are also sensitive to the power of uh, leadership, which has been and it will be a strong instrument to bring about not only legitimacy of sustainability changes, but also the inner energies as Hippocrates, the Greek thinker of centuries ago, uh, said about human subjectivity. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, the inner energy such as motivation, ideals, and behavioral commitment as required by long-term legitimacy of the uh, replacement of fossil energy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Sigmar. Thank you all. Well, um, I'm sorry, we have very difficult technical problems here. So we, we go ahead the, the way we can. Well, thank you very much for all the panelists for wonderful um, approaches. Uh, let's just do a, a, a quick round here in, in, in it. Uh, some of the questions, maybe with how could we develop a sustainable mindset? Um, Rocio, maybe you could start because we don't hear you for a long time. So if you can start just sharing, how do you think of hearing all these things? Uh, what could be one or two hints of interesting ways to, to develop a sustainable mindset? Well, I, uh... First of all, thank you uh, again to, to you and uh, all the panel. The, all the presentations have been very, very interesting. I think, I think that maybe just a co couple of things um, about how do we develop it. We have been talking a lot uh, uh, across the presentations on how we have to include um, uh, stakeholders, different methods, different ways, different things to consider. 
We have talked about contextualization, which is really important. I mentioned it, Fatima did as well, uh, Kathleen. But we have not talked very much about the difference of age. And I think this is an important area that we are forgetting. Now, when, when I was when I was student at university and we started to talk about sustainability, we were talking about the next generations. So mm -hmm. now my students and the other students, they are supposed to be the next generation. And honestly, it's not happening. So we have to rethink about what we have to do to involve this. And we're talking here about a selected group, let's say, if we talk about the students. But if we really want to talk about the overall gen, uh, population who, who we need to bring into this, this type of projects, maybe we should really think about how we can have access to, or how we can lead them to have access to some more information. We talk about an, an era of information, but it's, the, it's probably the wrong information we are giving. So it, is, uh, it was just mentioned a lot uh, by, by uh, Professor Sigmar, a lot of consumerism, uh, uh, many things that are not maybe ex the exact path that we need to reconsider again some of these issues on sustainability. So I would say maybe we need to rethink uh, first how we provide the information and which is the relevant information we need to, we need to provide. I really don't think that that could really be a mind change, but at least we can restart again. Remember that in the 70s, there were loads of campaigns about environment and they seem to have been forgotten. We had to bring back informal education. And, I, and, and in Europe, you would think, oh, everybody is really conscious, not necessarily we have to really go back to some of the basics on, on this informal education to try to, to be wider in terms of who we, who we are going to reach out and which are the key messages. I think these mm -hmm. two would be a, a way to start the discussion, let's say. I will leave it there so we can all have an opportunity. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Rocio. Uh, who else would like to jump in with their thoughts? Go ahead, Kathy, please. Thank you. And I'm going to take my hand down, uh, my Great. virtual hand, that is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfectly. OK, thank you. Uh, I think Rocio raised some really excellent points in addition to others on the panel. And just building on the idea of uh, learning and differences across ages, um, I would like to say also, uh, I think we can consider that in terms of the influencers that relate to those different age groups. Um, and so I would suggest that um, we could have um, different influencers. Uh, for example, if the political leaders of all our countries would buy their bicycles to work every day and have uh, clean energy um, powering their palaces or their homes and better yet small homes like the rest of us, uh, they could be demonstrating in real life, in real terms, and fostering the learning with leadership examples uh, for the rest of the community. Um, in terms of the differences across age groups, wow, just imagine if um, sports stars uh, were doing the same and um, um, musician uh, artists, um, and through their various channels, whether it's social media or other means, um, providing ways for people to learn with them. Uh, I think that alone could be a great game changer. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, good, good thoughts, Kathy. There, there is, um, I just wanted to mention, there is something, there is a comment here for, from somebody. I don't know if I'm going to say the name uh, correctly. Sir. Kirkis and 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 here it's it's got very much to do with what we are talking about. They said there's a multiple of opportunities for a just transition, including reskilling of human resources, starting even from the university education options that are provided to the new classes and repurposing the te technical skills in the labor force, such as between drilling and geothermal energy. What is the role of universities in ensuring the needed skills upgrades 
for the renewable energy transition. Who would like to go for that one? Sweeney? Uh, you want to make any comment on that? Yeah, please. There you are. I think that in the university, we also have to work a little bit with dissemination of information. Uh, we see that the students are interested on energy transition, on renewable energy. Uh, when they, we discuss the subject, they always are interested, but there is a, still a, a lack of information. Uh, and uh, this uh, is reflected in some kind of behavior uh, of the, the students. Uh, I think that uh, we should work uh, to develop further this kind of capacity building uh, because people listen about the energy transition, about renewables, but it's something like a, Someday it's going to happen. Uh, and it's important to, to realize that this is something to be done now, that we have a, an urgent that this has to be developed now because of all the, the issues related to climate change. Uh, thank you very much, Suwini. Um, and, and considering that we have to do this now, it means that we, we have to work with behavior, right? So a lot of this, you know, the people, they understand, okay, we have to go to renewables, but uh, uh, I don't have to do anything about it, you know, I don't have to change my behavior. And how do we sensibilize the people in, in order to, you know, that's, that's with your behavior, that's what you're doing today, you know, and, and with the, the options or with the choices you do. So um, uh, what do you think about that? Um, I saw a hand up, was it? No. no. It, it, it was me, Karen, but it was more related to the to the previous point. Okay, but, uh, maybe great. if you want to, to allow uh, maybe Fatima or, or Sid okay. Martin, Fatima. Then I'll come back. Could you jump in? Because behavior is with you, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think it's very difficult, of course. We know that. But I think it's important um, Conscientize the people to the impact of their behavior. Um, we don't. We 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 think we, we that we are uh, worried about the environment, but in fact, uh, we maintain our traditional behaviors. Uh, it's very difficult now in, in Europe with the the, the 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 crisis of energy. Um, the, the people don't want to change, don't want to uh, have the, the, in the central Europe uh, the houses um, so hot they uh, as they used used to have. So it's very difficult to change the, the, the behavior because the people are very. It is difficult to change. So perhaps. Um, when we understand the impact of our behavior, we have uh, uh, like this uh, to don't use plastic. But it's important to understand that is this kind of things, this is kind of things that are sometimes uh, fashionate, uh, it's uh, uh, have impact also uh, in the environment and what kind of impact they have. And when they are old, not so nice. Uh, if we don't use it, this is uh, uh, this have impact in, in the environment. So perhaps uh, it's um, especially in the universities connected to these two questions, um, where the people are more informed, have more education. It's important that people know the impact of this small. And small uh, behaviors, because all our behaviors have uh, impact 
on the um, impact on the on the, uh, on the environment. And uh, we don't, we can't uh, change uh, some behaviors for other behaviors that also have an important impact in the, in the environment. So I, I think it's a very difficult uh, question. <laughs> Probably that's why it, 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 it had so much discussion, you know, and so much of, of these of these interesting presentations that you brought, uh, because really it is very challenging. And, and uh, for a long while, they've been um, focusing more on the, the technology side of, of the kind of the transition, but less on the behavior, you know. So now we really have to dig into this together because technology, economics and environment environmental and, and people are all together. If, if, if you don't do it in one side, the other side will fall, you know, so it, it has to be done together. So I would like to go to you, Professor Sigmar, to ask you about how do you think, uh, what's the main uh, focus that leadership can do, you know, in order to deal with this kind of the challenge of the behavior? <clears throat> I, I think that we are doing a lot of things really a lot of things but they uh, we are doing them but they have not been as fertile as we have expected okay uh, because because it lacks coordination one of the main problems of our present day society is the fragmentation of events the fragmentation of events uh, turn people with a narrow mind because they see less the totality and see uh, small pieces the, uh, the, of totality. I think that uh, I will come back to an author I have studied many years ago and still do. Uh, uh, Hannah Arendt, and to come to uh, to hear uh, ideas about a big problem like this. Um, first, uh, yes, we need to coordinate our dispersed initiatives and to concentrate to give them power. Okay, because many times the initiatives are very good, but they don't have the power of transformation. Okay, and we need to fertilize that power. What to do in order to uh, develop a leadership in that direction? I think two things. First of all, collective. Um, thinking, corrective, uh, collective critical um, uh, discussions, uh, which according to Hannah Arendt is the political power that we need in this enterprise. And the second is to uh, involve and to focus the socialization and resocialization processes that is going on always in society in order to put a sustainability as part of the routine. Routine has a big power of transformation and we need to use that power to involve that power of routine so two things to your question karen is the uh, collective uh, thinking uh, of our uh, sustainability and the second is to put it in our routines. Thank you very much. I think that's that's very insightful in a very insightful thought and I think that's you know uh, very related to what each of what each of us can do. Right. So for us to go to the closing, uh, because the presentations were very interesting and we've got a little time here only for finishing our discussions, um, like we are a multidisciplinary team, 
I would ask you then to give your, your ideas about how can a multidisciplinary approach contribute more effectively addressing the challenges and opportunities of sustainability that we are talking about? You know, so thinking that here we are a group of people that have engineering, people from administration, people from uh, international relations and psychology and things. Oh, so there's a broad view, people from energy and bioenergy and this kind of thing. Um, so how do you think this multidisciplinary approach can contribute? Well, let me start okay. with the first answer to your question. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, multidisciplinary is an area in which we recognize our ignorance. Uh, we know a lot, we may know a lot about uh, one topic, uh, two or three topics, but today uh, interventions in society uh, do not <clears throat> allow superficial and uh, uh, fragmented interventions. So the uh, acknowledgement of that condition obliges us to dialogue with other fields, other fields. Today, I am convinced, really convinced, that psycholo organizational psychology, which is my field, main field, uh, organizational behavior, it cannot present solutions alone to anything. So I need to find uh, partners from other disciplines. And uh, that is the way we need to go on. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Jose, would you like to mention uh, and your closing thoughts? Thank you, Karen. I think um, uh, we have moved in the last, uh, I would say uh, even a little bit more than 10 years into multidisciplinarity, probably even a, bit, a little bit more. But we are still working in silos. I think that is, is, is really the problem, that yeah. uh, it, there is not really this integration. Should We should be talking about multi-integration. And the other thing I, I was uh, uh, also uh, thinking about uh, on, on these issues and with the uh, behavior and, um, and um, uh, these aspects of, of uh, uh, champions, let's say, or, or giving some, uh, uh, having some influencers. I think that uh, we need also to share more responsibility. I mean, it's not just the policymakers, it's also, it's also us as researchers, as citizens, as family members, as communities. So this share of responsibility, I don't think it's really widely, widely spread. So that, that would be a, another issue. And for this share responsibility, we need to have more co-development. We cannot just give things to people to say, this is how we have to do it. We really need to co-develop. We really need to uh, co-design uh, many of, of these uh, solutions together because then there will not be acceptance. There will not be uptake of, of the solutions. So we really need to start to moving into, into these uh, directions. We have some few examples, but because it's always uh, at, at a very level academic um, uh, communities. So we really need to, to expand it and really en enroll with other different types of stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Kathy, do you want to, to, to give your thoughts on that, please? Sure, absolutely. So I would say to the question about um, multidisciplinary approaches, um, and I would also add cross-sectoral approaches um, we need to remember that there are strengths and weaknesses coming from each of those domains. Uh, and if done well, we can be harnessing the strengths across all of them uh, to advance um, a, a better solution than if we're working in parallel or separately. Uh, and so the key is who are the integrators or how is the integration happening? And I think that really depends on an individual community um, not only the, the people um, it, within that community, but how they interact and govern themselves. 
Uh, and so that's where uh, the all important psychologists on our panel here um, have some very um, big opportunities to keep us um, focused on the, the best ways forward in that space. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Let's hope, let's hope working together that we can achieve that. Um, talking about psychologists, can we hear um, Fatima? I think uh, that, that my, my colleagues already say very interesting things. And I, I, in my opinion, the, the, the question is more than, uh, uh, than a, a multidisciplinary approach, is work together uh, and find solutions together, not only different approach, but work together, especially work with the community, with the, the, the different levels of government and so on. So I think it's um, very difficult and important um, situation. So I think we need to, to, to work. Uh, the, the different levels uh, need to work together to, to find the, not a solution, but different solutions uh, to achieve the, 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 the big solution. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Sweeney, your closing remarks here about this topic. Well, the, uh, as I said, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, uh, I would like just to, to recall uh, one issue. Uh, the, the importance in, of the participation of media in general. Uh, media could help a lot in dissemination information and changing, helping changing behaviors. And we see, at least uh, in Brazil, uh, we, we see some tentatives, some experience of media uh, to explore climate change issues and uh, renewables and talking about changing behaviors. And uh, this is not so much uh, well done or so much uh, coordinate. Uh, and I think this could be explored more. Uh, university could use it more for disseminating information and to try to, to change uh, a little bit behaviors. Thank you very much, Sunny. Thank you very much, all. Uh, I think we've got a very good uh, set of, of um, here of ideas of ways to go forward, to move forward. We needed another two hours to discuss this, really, because people are complex, we are complex, and you know, <laughs> so it's very challenging. Well, but I think time has come and probably the coordination will tell me we have to cut off. So I will, I will finish off thanking everybody for, you know, participation, uh, for the panelists, for the wonderful ideas shared over here, and for the committee for inviting us and receiving us to discuss so important subject as the social perception and behavior of people, you know, and how we involve people in this. So thank you very much, each one of you, um, Rocio, Kathy, Fatima, um, Sue and E and Sidimar that came over here so that we could do it together. Unfortunately, we had technical problems over here, but we, we were able to handle it. And thank you very much, Rita, and all the committee of the conference organization. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, and thank you for all uh, panelists, Kathy, Rocio, Fatima, and Sue and E and Sidimar. It was very, very, uh, uh, useful and, and successful panel, I think. For me, it was very, very nice. And you, all of you have my gratitude for this panel. And now I have to finish this session and the third day sessions and invite all of you to come tomorrow for the last day, another uh, panel uh, concerning uh, energy transition and, and decarbonization. I think you will be, be also very interesting and very uh, helpful for, for everybody. Then you are invited to come. And for all the attendees, don't forget to go to the virtual sessions, ask questions, uh, interact with your colleagues and everyone. So see you all of you tomorrow. Thank you very much for the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.